Okay, let us all stand as we begin today's celebration of the life of Brother Stephen, Matthew Stephen, with prayer. We are praying. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here with family and with friends. We ask your Lord that you be with us, be with those who are here, be with the family, and we pray, O oh Lord, that we'll have a wonderful afternoon in your name. We pray, amen. Please be seated. We shall begin with our first song, The Old Rugged Cross. It's the first song in our leaflet. Truth is I 
continue to sing day by day in our leaflet as the last page day by day and with each passing moment strength I find to meet my trials here Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. We can all say this afternoon that God is good. <clears throat> Despite the many difficulties and challenges that we face, we can all testify that God is indeed very good. Brothers and sisters, we have gathered here this afternoon, I believe, for three main purposes. First, to honor the memory of Brother Matthew and to celebrate his life and to thank God for blessing us through him. I noticed that <clears throat> Brother Matthew lived just two days short of his allotted time. And of course, we can say to God be the glory. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. On the 8th of September, he would have been 70 years. Hmm? And he, died, he passed away on the 6th. Okay? 
And secondly, brothers and sisters, we are here to comfort and encourage the bereaved family and relatives in the loss. And I believe most importantly, we are here for our personal spiritual reflection. We live at a time when by God's grace, every day that we live, we need to ask God to make our calling and election sure. So that any time our turn comes to leave this world, we can say, like Brother Tom, all is right with God. And we can die in Jesus and look forward to the first resurrection. So on behalf of the pastors and members of this church, I extend our deepest condolences to the family and relatives of, of Brother Stephen. I also, on behalf of the family and the church, the Zion Church, welcome all of you to this funeral service. And it is our hope that God is going to bless us tremendously through this service. At this time, I invite all of you to please stand for the opening prayer. Let us pray. Our compassionate, ever-loving and gracious God, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We give you praise, adoration, honor, and glory. Lord, every funeral vividly reminds us that death is an intrusion to the perfection of Eden brought on by sin. It is the enemy of everything that is good. It disrupts us of our joys and plans. But we can say praise the Lord and we thank you Lord that Jesus has conquered death on our behalf. And so we look forward to that glorious day when sin will be finally destroyed and eternity will be ours. May we this afternoon, dear Lord, honor and celebrate the life of Brother Stephen. May the family and relatives be comforted and blessed through this funeral service. And may we all, dear Lord, take this moment to reflect on our relationship with you. Teach us, dear Lord, to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So bless us abundantly for this service, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Please be seated. At this time, I... Invite Melinda, Melani, and Melanica Stephen to do a welcome song. I think this is. Okay. So Hello let us. everyone, welcome to the funeral service of our Grandpa Matthew Stephen. Come thy fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy ever ceasing call for songs of loud 
Amen, brothers. Praise God, praise God, praise God. At this time, I will invite Sister Sherina Alexis and Sister Shomaika Marius to render to us a special song. After this, the service will continue unannounced.
honor at this time to give the tribute, honor Imab. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Melina Stephen Matthews, daughter. On behalf of my family, we appreciate you all for being here with us today, including those on various streaming platforms to celebrate the life of my father. My father, Matthew Stephen, better known as Brother Tom Fue Matu, was born on September 8, 1951, and died September 6, 2021. He was predeceased by his mother, Petrona Teresa Joseph, and father, Fitzroy Charles. He grew up in the community of Labby with his grandma, tattooed along with his adopted brothers, Sisai and Duki, until age nine. From what we know, he had a great childhood despite the many challenges of life. My father began working construction at age 11 and worked even a few weeks before his illness. Daddy suffered from both high blood pressure and diabetes, which took a dramatic toll on his health. He was in constant pain and somehow could barely walk. However, with the rising of the sun, he would wake up and pray, thanking God for another day, listening to Jukwang going to work. The majority of his working life was spent, was spent sorry, building marigold. His workmanship was impeccable which many can attest to. The attention that he gave to his work can be seen all over the architecture of in St. Lucia. When we look back on the life of our father, we all can say unanimously that he was a devoted, hard-working man. A skilled worker who loved his career as a mason. He was compassionate and humble, never one to burden us with his problems, super independent and a go-getter. He was never a man of many words, but we felt his love through his actions. As a member of the Labby Seventh-day Adventist District, he served in the capacity of a deacon and elder, and was also a dean at some point. Our father raised us in the fear of the Lord. We always had family worship, and this was the greatest gift a father can give to his children. Growing up, growing up I remember that I remember always had our backs and he made us feel protected. Like that one time, Vern and I got into a fight with a childhood friend. Instead of being upset or quarreling, Daddy broke the fight and said, don't worry, we'll take them later. Sure enough, we took them later, but we had to promise not to get into a fight again. I am humbled by my stepmother's strength over the past few weeks with her ability to focus on the amazing life that she shared with my father and not well on what she had lost. We feel so grateful to have so much time as we did with my father. I miss him so much already and will forever remember having an incredible man as my father. The memories of him will be cemented in our hearts just as those concrete he used to build those houses. While we are trying to correct a minor technical problem, I'll invite the choristers to do the hymn of meditation. Until then.
Brothers and sisters, I now invite you to listen to the second part of the eulogy done by Melina and Jonaki Stephen. It is rather unfortunate that I can't be here with my family and siblings to celebrate the life of my father, Matthew Stephen. I would like to share my father's final moments and his bravery, even in the face of death. I like to think that my father waited for me to get home before his demise so that his personal nurse could take care of him one last time. That first week of August when he complained of not feeling well, I knew it had to be something serious. Daddy was never one to complain so immediately I went over to assess him but his vital signs were all okay which surprised me because as a chronic hypertensive I did not expect his blood sugar to be within normal, his blood pressure sorry, to be within normal parameters. I told him eat and be sure to drink water as he appeared a bit dehydrated. He said okay. I went to work that day and would call home frequently to check up on him. However, close to the end of my shift, Venancia informed that they had called ambulance. Apparently, his condition had worsened. Taking daddy to the hospital was nothing new. We had made several trips over the years as we know he unfortunately had suffered multiple strokes before. This time, for the first time, I was worried. My father held my hand and refused to let go. This strong man who was so full of life, still climbing rooftops and going to tend to his garden looked vulnerable, worried and weak. I kept monitoring him constantly, noting a gradual drop in his oxygen saturation. It was then I started to fear the worst, that we may be dealing with something serious. My worst fears were confirmed when lab results came back that showed alterations in multiple system organs, multiple organ systems, sorry. I reminded him, like the multiple strokes he had suffered before and survived, he will beat this. I remember the look he gave, he seemed defeated. I explained every procedure to him and kept reassuring him. When told that he would be admitted, I said to him, Daddy, I'll be back shortly. Going to collect your bag. He squeezed my hand and said to take care, I love you. I never questioned if he loved me or cared for me because he made it obvious, but actually saying those words just felt weird. It's like he knew his time was approaching. I remember being upset and calling my best friend saying, my father has lost his will to leave. Her response was, he just doesn't want to burden anybody. If only he understood that he wasn't a burden. On the first time calls to my siblings overseas, he would smile and wave and show them that he was okay. He promised Chanel that he would wait for her. However, following his first discharge, while feeding him with teary eyes, he admitted he was tired. He had no more fight left in him. A few days later, he would be readmitted. All that he wanted was to be home. He looked excited whenever I visited, thinking, okay, today is the day. Eventually, we agreed that it'd be best to listen to him for a change and grant him that request. I'll never forget that surge of energy that came over him that Friday morning. He walked out onto the balcony of VH, looked around, stared at the ship in the harbor, smiled and said, okay, let's go. He could not leave that hospital fast enough. Motioning to the orderly, hurry up, close the car door, as if the staff would stop him from leaving. Tapping me, okay, drive fast. I'll never forget that smile when we left that hospital gate. By the time we got home, however, that surge of energy was no more. He needed assistance getting out of the car. After a bath and making him comfortable in his bed, Daddy breathed a sigh of relief and never spoke a word again. Fast forward a few hours later, his condition was now changing from stable to critical. His breathing had changed. Daddy was refusing feeds and just wanted to sleep. It was time to accept reality. I remember clearly his wife Angela and sisters Merlin and Lorna singing The Great Physician Now Is Near. I reached out to Elder Jonge and Pastor Morian asking them to pray with him. By now Vern had joined us. Daddy was so relaxed during the final prayer service. He seemed at peace and for that I am thankful. His suffering was not long. Daddy would pass away the Monday morning. Death leaves a memory no one can heal. But again, it is a loving memory for me when I think about the life of my father. I choose to remember him as the most courageous and resourceful man. Thank you all for joining and sharing in the celebration of the life of my father. May we all be comforted knowing that he died in the Lord. It's not our place to question, only God knows why. Sorrow comes in great waves, but it rolls over us, and though it may almost smother us, it passes and we remain. My name is Johnny K. Stephen, granddaughter of Matthew Stephen. 
My grandfather was a humble and hardworking man who wouldn't want us to cry over him, for he admitted he was tired. He was a fighter. He was strong-willed. A man loved and adored by all who had the pleasure of having crossed his path at some point or another. Mato, as we along with many would sometimes call him, had come home from a difficult day's work and made sure everyone assisted in the completion of our home. Not even the girls were exempted from carrying blocks, water, sifting sand, and handing him tools. Though we may not have liked it at the time, he was touching us the meaning and the value of hard work. Even through his tiredness, he'd go to church and continue rendering his assistance whenever feasible to whoever needed it, no matter the circumstance. Matthew Stephen had his first son, Baskus, at the age of 22. One day while working on a project in Kalisak, he would meet his wife, the beautiful Miss Angela. Together they would go on to have three children, Nalda, Imran, and Chanel. Before he met and accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior, he would have another three children, Anna, Amelia, and Melvin. In the year 1996, he along with his amazing wife decided to give their life to Christ. They got baptized, got married, and together raised six children. Grandma, we thank you for your selfless love and patience in raising them as your own. Daddy, Matthew, and Matthew Stephen will be remembered and dearly missed by his loving wife, Miss Angela Stephen, his amazing seven children, and his fabulous and highly energetic eight grandchildren. His beloved sisters and brothers are not forgetting the Joseph and Charles family. I do not know how long it will take me to grieve this tremendous loss. My grandfather was one of the most important people in my life. His memory will live on forever. We look forward to that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the world is called up yonder and will be there. Until then, rest easy, Daddy. I would like to thank my cousins for this tribute and eulogy. If one thing I remember my uncle as is being this industrious, hardworking man. And even from the onset of his illness, he was always willing to help. And my uncle was one everybody knew as a hardworking man. And of course, was willing to assist. I remember seeing him sick and he's willing to, you know, do something. He's out in the yard, he's, 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 he's digging a gutter, he's doing something. And he, we, we will always remember him as this hardworking, loving man that he was. I invite you now to listen to our scripture reading, which is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. And it's taken from the New International Version. And I will read in your hearing. And the word of the Lord says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on, but, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. May God add his blessings to the reading of his holy word.
My dear brothers and sisters, I 
echo the sentiments of those who have preceded me, extending sincere condolences to everyone who is grieving, particularly the members of the immediate family. We are mourning the loss of a good friend. It is interesting to think of the agility that he had in his youth. Very quick on his two feet. Beautiful cover drive when we play in cricket. And then a few things changed physically. And it's as though he transitioned, focusing on that one thing that meant more to him than everything else. And that's where we bonded again. I particularly remember those times we shared in that prayer group. No matter how he felt, Tom was always there. He would have problems sometimes articulating what he wanted to say, but he was always there. But we look forward to a time by the grace of God when, in a way of speaking, time will restart. We will have a new beginning. It is not wishful thinking. It is not fantasy. It's reality. In our scripture reading, which was so well presented by Cornelia, we are reminded of God's plans for us human beings. God has promised a tremendous future. It was not God's original design for us to live in a world of sin. God designed perfection. When God created a perfect world, and declared that everything was very good. Even before he created the woman, he decided, oh no. This is very good, but I've got to improve on it for human beings. So the Lord God planted a garden. To be the home for human beings. That's how special we are to God. That is the reason that, as Jesus himself declared to Nicodemus, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. 
God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. The world there is not the physical structures, the planet, the trees, the oceans, the seas. No. It's the people. It's us. But since human beings chose to sin, God in his love and mercy designed a plan to rescue us so that once again we would be able to live forever guaranteed. That time is coming soon. That is the reason that when you know you are a believer, yes, a believer, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him, that's what makes you a believer. You will not perish, you will have eternal life. Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself. He is coming soon. But when we are believers and we have this blessed hope, When we find ourselves struggling with the problems of life, we can say with the apostle, even though we are hard pressed on every side, we are not crushed. Even though we are perplexed, we do not despair. We may find ourselves persecuted and tried, but we know we are never abandoned. We may be struck down, knocked down, but we are not destroyed, we are not knocked out. That's where God comes in. And therefore, with this relationship in place, we do not lose heart. We hold on. We stay strong. Because we know that even though outwardly we are changing and not for the better. Yeah. You know, people like Tom and me would look at the photographs of us in activities when we were young and we would smile. But it's in our minds. And the same thing will happen to you. You will wrinkle. You will age. And even though you shave your head clean, the white will still pop through it. But then we have this assurance from the scriptures that even though sickness, disease 
will strike your body. Even though like Tom, it will affect your mobility. Although in all fairness to him, he was extraordinary. He kept bouncing back every time. And working more or less just as hard as he always had been. But you know, no matter what we do, we cannot fight this thing forever and win. But still we do not lose heart. We do not get discouraged. Because inwardly, we are being renewed. It's like we're getting younger on the inside while we get older on the outside. Because it's all about the relationship of God. We focused on that relationship. And in the eyes of our mind, we look forward to that time. When we will be forever young. It's not fantasy. It's not wishful thinking. It's reality. We are given the assurance that the problems we go through in this life, the pain we endure, that's nothing compared to the joy, the bliss that awaits us in the world to come. So, I encourage you, like our friend Tom chose to do, fix your gaze not on what is seen, not on what is visible, Fix your gaze on the unseen. The true reality. See Jesus on his way already. The hymn writer puts it this way. Just over the mountains. In the promised land lies the holy city built by God's own hands. Why just over the mountains? Because we are climbing the rough side of this mountain. And the climbing is not always pretty. It's not relaxing. There's no time to stop for a breather. Because we are in a war. But we are nearing home. We are nearing home. As we fix our gaze on what is unseen, we can see the splendor streaming from the gates ajar. We can see the glory streaming through these portals open wide, very soon we'll enter. Never more to roam. As we fix our gaze on that which is eternal, we can actually hear the singing of the angels. We are nearing home. But while we are waiting for the second coming. We will still have to deal with stuff like this. You will still have to weep over a loved one who is sick. You will still have to agonize and pray for the healing of someone precious to you. You will still have to look on feeling helpless. 
at the pain and the anguish, knowing there's nothing you can actually do to change things for the better. But in all of this, you can keep on trusting, knowing that our destiny, when we have chosen to live for Christ, is in the hands of one who never makes mistakes and who can never go wrong. One of my favorite quotations is this. God would not make any decision for you which would be different from what you would make for yourself if, like him, you could see the future and everything in between. Trust God. Trust him with your life. Give yourself to him. Choose to believe in him. Choose to accept him. And remember my parting words. Whether you choose to believe in him or not, you will wrinkle, you'll get sick. If you are fortunate enough, you'll grow old. And you'll die. But you will not live forever. But if you choose to believe in him, you will go through the trials of this life just like those who choose not to believe. But when it's over, guaranteed you will live forever. I encourage you to choose wisely and choose to believe. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. We thank God for a very timely message. The Bible says that those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In times like these, brothers and sisters, we must wait upon our omnipotent omnipresent and omniscient God. He is our refuge and our fortress. The God in whom we trust. At this time, I will do the prayer of comfort for the family on our behalf. So I invite you to please get ready. Let us all stand, join the family. Because of COVID and the protocols, I will, not, I will not call anybody to come forward. So you'll just stay in your seat and please turn. Let us pray. Oh God, our help in ages past our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, our eternal hope, eternal home, a very present help in trouble. Lord, we thank you for Jesus our heavenly high priest, our savior, the one whose heart is touched with our grief. We thank you for Jesus. We also, dear Lord, thank you for blessing us, 
blessing the church, the Zion church. Brother Matthew's family, his relative's friend, and St. Lucia, through his faithful, committed, and diligent life. At this time, dear Lord, we present the family, relatives, and friends to you. We pray, dear Lord, that you will comfort them, bless them, do for them exceeding abundantly, above what they can think, ask, or imagine. Help them, dear Lord, to claim your, the promises in your word and to be encouraged in you. May they, dear Lord, look joyfully forward to the eternal reunion with Brother Matthew and their loved ones. May you, dear Lord, be above them to bless them. Below them to protect them. Before them to lead and guide them. Beside them to comfort and to strengthen them. These are the mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Please sit. At this time, I invite the witnesses, Milda Stephen, Imran Stephen, Chanel Nicola, and Melvin Stephen to meet Pastor Charles at the table on my left for the signing of the register. During the signing of the register, the choristers will lead us in a congregational song. We will all blend our voices together in singing under his wings.
William Arthur Ward wrote, feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. The family of the late Matthew Stephen, better known as Brother Tom, would like to express heartfelt thanks to the families, relatives, and friends for their support during this bereaved moment. They would also like to extend sincere thanks for all the phone calls, donations, and flowers, and it has been truly appreciated. Thanks to the doctors, nurses, and staff at the Victoria Hospital for their support during the time of his sickness and the condolences received during this difficult moment. Special thanks to the Zion Seventh-day Adventist Church, the management and staff of Rambali's Funeral Parlor, and LNO Studios, along with our viewers on social media for attending the service today. The family expresses profound thanks to the persons who attended this funeral. Even during the COVID pandemic, we are feeling heartfelt gratitude and gratification for your presence today. At this time, we wish to remind everyone of the COVID-19 protocols, and as a result, there'll be no gathering at the house after the service. However, refreshments will be served once the body has been laid to rest. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Eternal God, our Father, we present ourselves to you, weak, sorrowful, give us joy in the midst of our grief, give us peace in the midst of our sadness, give us hope so that we do not despair. Give us an understanding that you are God, you will always be there. That this is not the end. A future, a glorious future awaits everyone. So as we leave this place, as we make our way to the burial place, may your angels continue with us. May every member of the grieving family experience a sense of your presence. May each one experience your loving embrace and your invitation to come because we are all weary and heavy laden. Give that rest in the relationship with you, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Brothers and sisters, we have had a very blessed funeral service. We thank God for his blessing. I invite you to please listen to the following instruction and cooperate with us. During the recessional, the procession will be led by the platform personnel followed by the pallbearers, then the immediate family members, and finally the rest of the congregation. 
Thank you very much for your cooperation. Our, the choristers will lead us in the re recessional hymn, which is when we all get together, when we all get to heaven. So let us please stand for the recessional hymn. Well, 
God just took the only one I know So I'll hold you as close as I can Longing for the day when I see your face again But until then, God must need another angel around the throne tonight. Your love lives on inside of me, and I will hold on tight. It's not my place to question, only God knows why. Just jealous of the angels around the throne tonight Singing hallelujah 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 just jealous of the angels around the throne Kind of risky no. place. If we think of opening, we need it. And people get overwhelmed and whatnot and things happen. So, therefore, we will lower the casket and we will begin the search. Yeah?
We are here to, as it were, pay our last respect to our good friend and brother. In a way of speaking, it is an irony. Because as one of the deacons of the church, he has been here on several occasions, putting other people to their rest. And we are now here to witness him being placed to his room. But we can look forward to a reunion because God has promised that. And when that time comes, all the tears will be tears of joy. It will be a time for celebration. But in the meantime, for as much as God in his infinite mercy and wisdom has permitted our brother Matthew to lay down the burdens of this life, we now do tenderly commit his body in the hope of a joyful resurrection when our Lord shall return, when this body of our humiliation shall be changed and be made like unto his own glorious body, according to the mighty workings whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Let us pray. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Father, we present to you every person at this gravesite. Please, as we lay our brother to his rest, Thank you for the understanding that he is beyond pain. He is beyond suffering. But that he will live again in a brand new body. So we pray that you would keep us faithful. That you would comfort every family member. That you would give the reassurance to every person. If we are faithful, we will meet with him again. And this time there will be no party. Bless us with this understanding. And may your peace fill our hearts. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
stone when I am on your shoulders you raise me up to more than I can be To more